We light this candle as a sign of the coming light of Christ, as the Lord has promised in the days to come. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy in singing. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. This is the season of holy waiting. We wait for the one whose word can set captives free. We watch for the day when all who mourn will know gladness and praise. We wait while the dawning light appears on the horizon. Come, let us walk in the light of God. Please join me in the prayer of anticipation. Gracious God, we hear the promise of the coming of Jesus into a manger and into our hearts and homes. Bless our Advent waiting. Fill our worship with anticipation of your love and peace. Today, we would be quiet enough to hear your voice and still enough to feel your touch. Help us to find that place where we can receive as well as give, wait as well as act, and listen as well as speak. Keep us alert to the signs of your coming, knowing that you often enter our lives in new and unexpected ways. Even so, Lord, quickly come for our lives and for the life of the world. Amen. Good morning. This is the third Sunday in Advent, and our chrismon for this morning is the shepherd's crook. I'm sure that some of you recognize this because some of you have carried a crook as a shepherd in the annual Christmas pageant. You know, I'm sure you realize that the shepherds were important all through the Bible, but the night Jesus was born, they, as you know, were the first people to visit the manger. And do you know why that is? You know why they happened to be first ones there? That's because... They were, as the Bible says, out in the fields watching their flocks by night. Now, 
I want to be clear here. They weren't the night shift, okay? They were the day shift, the night shift. They were the all-around watchers of the sheep all the time. They slept with the sheep. They ate with the sheep. They drank with the sheep. They were there for the sheep because the sheep were their life, okay? And the sheep depended on them and knew that. So they listened to the shepherd's voice, okay? We use this shepherd's crook today to represent Jesus because that's what Jesus promised. Jesus promised that he was the good shepherd, that he would be with us. We would be his life. And you know what? All he asks in return is that he be ours, that we listen to him, that we learn from him, that we follow him. And in so doing, you know what? It makes shepherds of us all. Jesus said to Peter, Right before he left his disciples, he said, Peter, feed my sheep. Because he wanted Peter and all of us who have come after Peter as his disciples to be shepherds, to be people who look out for one another. So let us pray together. Jesus, we're so grateful that you were our good shepherd and that you are our good shepherd. Help us to know enough to follow you, to love you, to believe in you, that we too might be shepherds in your name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
please join me in the prayer for illumination. Living God, we are moved by the coming of Christ to our lives and we seek to be your people. Help us to live in faithful covenant with you and with one another. Let the peace of Christ guide us and let Christ's message in all its richness live in our hearts that we may joyfully welcome your incarnation and praise you in acts of loving kindness. Amen. The scripture readings this morning come from Isaiah chapter 6 and John chapter 1. From Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. From John chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 and 19 through 23. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. This testimony, given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. The response is, keep these words in your heart. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. How lovely are the messengers that bring us the gospel of peace. These words from Felix Mendelssohn's St. Paul Oratorio roughly translate Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, verses 14 to 15, and those verses roughly translate Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Advent reminds us that this good news, the news that our God reigns, is always in need of a messenger. Life Magazine's cover story for its December 1999 issue on the eve of the new millennium was entitled, 2,000 Years of Christianity, The Meaning of the Millennium. In it, best-selling author and historian Thomas Cahill was quoted as saying, it is undeniable that the world is a more just and merciful place because of the teachings of Jesus. However, he then hastened to add that he feels that all too often, Christianity's officialdom isn't concerned with in-the-field Christianity, and that individuals who call themselves Christian often fail to recognize Christ when he walks among them. Ouch. But wait, it gets worse. Many Christians, he said, especially higher clergy, are concerned only with the strength of Christianity as an institution, 
something Jesus showed no interest in, he rightly observes. But then, his harshest condemnation came when he wrote, they show little concern for the success of the gospel of peace and love. At first, he just made me mad. And then I thought, if he's right, then I certainly hope that I am one of Christianity's lower clergy. Fortunately, I know you, and I am dead certain that if at any time in my many years with you, I had ever started acting as though I was more concerned about the strength of the church as an institution than I was about the success of the gospel of peace and love, you would have called me on it, and you would have suggested long ago, Jim, it's time to do something else with your life. However, his statement is clearly not a concern for clergy alone. We all know that the real reason for our coming together as the church to be the body of Christ in the world is to be doing all we can to ensure the gospel has every possible chance to succeed. The church is and always has been about proclaiming the gospel and its central character, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the Word made flesh. One of the questions that Advent asks each of us and asks all of us is this, what have you done lately to take responsibility for the Word, the gospel, the good news? It asks us as disciples, individually and collectively, what have you done to ensure that God's word continues to become incarnate in a world that so desperately needs the gospel of peace and love to be embodied, to be enfleshed here and now. Our text for today helps us to remember that we take our cues about what it is we're supposed to be doing about the gospel from folks whose only knowledge of institutions was as vehicles of oppression and persecution, something they wanted no part of. The one of whom our gospel text speaks this morning was about as anti-institution as you can get. Listen again. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Need I say more? John didn't have an institutional bone in his body. He was the one, according to Matthew and Mark, who ran around in camel's hair and had breath that smelled of locusts and honey. He was a wild-eyed guide from the hill country. It was no wonder that he had a way of putting off the institutional types just a bit, getting under their skin, setting them on their ears, keeping them off balance. Indeed, the people who represented religion as an institution in John's day could not, for their lives, figure out who this guy really was. As we read the first chapter of the fourth gospel, it seems that we are learning more and more about who he isn't and less and less about who he is. Who are you? Well, I'm not the Messiah, in case you were wondering. Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Just when we're wondering where this is all going, they stop guessing and they ask him again, who are you? And he answered, and this is important, I am the voice of one. He said, I am one voice. And we are getting closer to understanding this man if we put that statement with an earlier one from the text that says, he came as a witness to bear testimony to the light, to be a voice so that all might believe through him. For centuries now, since John first came in from the wilderness to lay his life on the line as a voice of one witness bearing testimony to the light, this has been our calling. To realize that it has little to do with the institutions that we have built and so ambitiously maintain and everything to do with our being witnesses. November 14, 2020, just a month ago, marked the 60th anniversary of the day that six-year-old Ruby Bridges, flanked by federal marshals, walked into William France Elementary School in New Orleans. Ruby's historic walk is the subject of Norman Rockwell's iconic painting, The Problem We All Live With. Ruby was one of four children who were chosen to take the first steps towards desegregating the public schools in the state of Louisiana. Yes, it was the decisions of others, all of them adults, that started her on that journey. Yes, it took amazing courage to put one foot in front of the other that day, which she did without so much as a whimper, according to eyewitnesses. However, 
it's not that one moment in history that makes Ruby so remarkable. It is what she has done since. Throughout her life, she has been a voice, a witness for justice, for fairness, equality, and equity. She continues to be a messenger of peace to this day. Through the Ruby Bridges Foundation, she lectures and speaks everywhere, promoting the values of tolerance, respect, appreciation of all differences. She received the Presidential Citizens Medal from Bill Clinton, the second most prestigious honor a US citizen can receive. The Rockwell painting was on display at the White House for several months during Barack Obama's presidency. He and Ruby stood looking at it one day, and he remarked to her, I think it's fair to say that if it hadn't been for you guys, I probably would not be here, and we wouldn't be looking at this together. I can't think, friends, of a recent advent when the need for witnesses has been more urgent. One that has implored us to use our words and actions to be messengers for peace and justice. One that has pointed, it, pointed to areas of deep darkness and demanded that we testify to the light, the light that continues to come into the world in Jesus Christ. How will we put ourselves in the story this Christmas? How will we show the world that we do recognize Christ when he's among us, when he walks among us? You know that I don't like to challenge you without offering ways to respond. The late Marge Carpenter, former moderator of our denomination, used to say that she was sinfully proud to be a Presbyterian. Well, I want you to know I am sinfully proud of this congregation for taking the bold and faithful step of answering the call to become a Matthew 25 church. The operative word, of course, is become. For being a Matthew 25 church means we will actively be engaged in one or more of the following ministries. Building congregational vitality by challenging people to deepen their faith and get actively and joyfully engaged with the community and the world. Dismantling structural racism by advocating and acting to break down the systems, the practices, the thinking that underline discrimination bias, prejudice, and oppression of people of color. Eradicating systemic poverty by working to change laws, policies, plans, and structures in our society that perpetuate economic exploitation of people who are poor. What this means is that we have officially said we will continue to put our money, our resources, our energy, our lives where our mouths are and continue to be witnesses to be messengers for peace and justice that Advent needs us to be. I tell you this to remind us that there's a light that shines in spite of us, but that it only reaches all the places where it is needed when we are willing to bear testimony to it, when we are willing to keep it focused on the places where the world's darkness is most pervasive and persistent. In some faith traditions, can I get a witness? is a question that can often be heard within the context of any given worship service. I would suggest that it is a question that God and Jesus Christ is always asking of us and that there's no time when it rings more clearly, more distinctly in our ears than in Advent, this time when we give witness to the light that no darkness can overcome. It is a reminder that we need to consider all the year long what our gifts are, that we can offer in giving witness to the gospel of peace and love. Amen. Let us pray for peace for the healing of creation May God's truth and justice
Let us pray. Watching and waiting for the coming of Christ, we pray for the promise of a new creation, saying, come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the church. Anoint us with the gift of your spirit that we may truly be witnesses to your incarnate word. May we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, and set the captive free, and know that in so doing, we are indeed proclaiming the gospel. Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for this community and for the world. Be present in abandoned and forgotten neighborhoods, places where deep mourning overshadows joy, and healthy food is hard to find. Be present in a world where fear breeds distrust of our neighbors around the corner or on the other side of the globe. Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for loved ones. 
Healing God, you know the needs and hopes of each person. Bring comfort to all who are sick in body, mind, or spirit. Solace to those who are mourning. Give us peace of mind and calm our spirits as we take seriously and heed the words of warning about a worsening pandemic. Remembering our commandment to love, we pray for our enemies and those who trouble us, as well as those whose presence in our lives brings great joy. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. God of hope, as the promised day approaches, fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit and strengthen us to serve you faithfully through Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace and live as free people. Hold fast to what is good. Render no one evil for evil. Support the weak and the faint-hearted. Love and serve the Lord and rejoice always in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.